<laughs> or that Pastor Tom did because your questions were so good. And I just want, I do want to thank you, number one, for listening in your class to what you're taught. Number two, and really important, for actually thinking about those questions, about the things you're being taught, and asking questions about them. So, congratulations. You are 800% more popular than I am. <laughs> Thank you very much, and you can be dismissed to your class. Thank you much. Give them a hand as they leave. This morning I want to begin by asking you to do something that I know is not terribly comfortable, but let me ask you to do it anyway. I want to ask you two questions, and as I ask them to you, I'm going to ask you to cl just close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes, and you answer affirmatively yes or no by the raising of your hand. So everybody close your eyes, because I don't want you to see what other people are doing. So that's the purpose of your closing your eyes, okay? So please close your eyes, just so everybody has anonymity here. First thing. If I were to be able this morning to give you everything you need to genuinely hear from God and know what it is that He would have you to do, and that out of that you would be willing to listen to what God shared with you to do, would you want that and desire that and follow that. If you would, just raise your hand, yes. Okay, put your hands down. If you would not honestly be able to do that, raise your hand, no. Okay, you can raise your, close your, put your hands down now. Second question. If that was to cost you something very important to you, let's say, all the money you had set aside for whatever it is you're, you've got money set aside for. All that's in bank accounts, all that's in investments, whatever that might be. Or maybe it would cost you your, your car or cars and you would not be able to get around easily. Or maybe that would cost you your home, a place to live. Now honestly, before God, Everybody's eyes are closed. If you're still willing to follow that, would you raise your hand? Yes. Put them down, and if not, would you raise your hands? No. And there's a whole lot of people that did not raise their hands. Okay, you can open your eyes. Thank you very much. That helps me out, because we're going to be looking at a text this morning that gives us an opportunity to genuinely hear from God in and, and, and such a way that it may not be comfortable to really listen to what it is he's sharing with you. It comes in the form of... Chapter 12, verse 1, near the end of the verse, Let us we'll talk lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There are a couple of things said here as a means to running. It says, lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. Not just sins. Don't just lay aside sins to run this race. Lay aside every other weight that gets in your way. What this says is, don't just ask, what's wrong with it? Don't just ask, is it a sin? That's about the lowest question you can ask in life. So what, well, preacher, what question should I ask if it's not, is it a sin? And the answer is, does it help me run? That's the answer. Does it get in my way? when I'm trying to become more patient, more kind, more gentle, more loving, more holy, more pure, more self-controlled? Does it get in my way? Or does it help me 
run. Look to Jesus and lay aside sins for sure and lots of other stuff too. And a little voice is going to say, this looks like a lot of loss and not much gain. At that point, open your Bible to Hebrews 12, 2 and look at how Jesus in Gethsemane said, tomorrow morning, is going to be a lot of loss. This is going to be mega loss at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. In fact, it's going to happen all night long. I will never sleep again before I die. And it's going to hurt like hell, literally. How did he do that? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross So the answer is, yes, it's going to be loss. But I promise you, on the authority of God's word, the Christian life is gain. Say to the flesh and say to Satan, the sufferings of this life are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to me. And so, I will lay aside every weight, and I will lay aside every sin, And I will run with Jesus. The question in a moment of passion, in a moment of really listening to what God has to say, and the passions of the moment, we might answer differently than what we did when we started the service this morning and I asked you those questions. We can all be motivated by the truth of the gospel message, but the question is, will we maintain the character and the integrity, the the Christ-followingness of our being when we are not in church on a Sunday morning, when we're faced with the realities of living every day and when we're touched by those who are not very lovely and are demanding something of us. What will we do then? How will we live our lives in those times? Galatians 2 verse 20, if you want to turn your Bibles there this morning, we'll be there for the entire morning. Galatians 2.20 is a great mystery. There's a mystery there because there is a tension between what we're being told and our protective uh, self-aggrandizing self-desire to stay comfortable and healthy and well at the cost of whatever else lie before us. And so the great mystery of, of being crucified with Christ becomes not so attractive a thing to us when we start talking about what is it going to cost us. I have been crucified with Christ, and yet I live. It is not I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me And who gave himself for me. This message has so much more than I can preach in one morning. So much more. I I once preached five Sundays on this one text. And I tell you, I didn't do it justice in five Sundays. I certainly won't do it justice this morning. But this is a mystery. Why do I say it's a mystery? Well, I have been crucified with Christ and yet I live. I'm crucified. When you're crucified, by definition, before you come off the cross, you are dead. Colossians 3.3 says you are dead, and yet you live in Christ. You are dead, and yet you live in Christ according to God. I'm crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Let's talk about the paradox, the oxymoron that's here. Death and life. So let's just talk about it a moment. 
What is an oxymoron? Two things are put together that don't go together. In fact, they're normally polar opposites. I'll give you an example this morning. We hear it said in our culture, well, it's the same difference. How can it be the same and be different? And yet we, we all have some sort of understanding of what that means. Jumbo shrimp. tight slacks, or I've been having computer problems this last month, so this is, this is my favorite of the month, Microsoft Works. <laughs> Doesn't. But God gives us this paradox, this thing that we should question in our minds because it will bring us closer to him if we will but hear what he's telling us. Death in order to live. Here's the formula. Dead to self equals life in Christ. And how many of us yet are willing to say, I will die to self. I'll die to my self-interest. I'll die to my self desires, my, my self being protected and made comfortable. I'll die to selfish ambitions. I'll die to everything of self in order that I might walk in the Spirit, live the Christ life. Now, I'm talking this morning and assuming what any preacher ought not to assume, and that is that those of you listening to this message this morning know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. I'm speaking as if I am speaking to Christians this morning. So if you're sitting here this morning and you are unsaved, none of this is going to make a whole lot of sense to you. But this morning I hope that the Holy Spirit inside of every living, breathing Christian, Christ follower, will hear this message and understand that death to self equals living in Christ. This reality is not something that is attractive to the carnal man. It is not something that is attractive to those of us who have self-protective initiatives going on in our lives all the time. It's not, it's not something that the flesh desires by any means. It is something quite unnatural in this fallen world. So don't think I'm asking you to do something natural. Listen, I'm asking you to do something supernatural. In fact, this morning, if you make up your mind, I'm just going to try hard to do what Pastor Dave says this morning, you will fail. Here is the reality. The only way to do anything that we're going to talk about today is not to try hard, but to submit to God's Word and the Spirit of God within you. It's to give up trying hard. It's to give in to Him and allow Him to so lead your life that you become so accustomed to this walk in Christ that you come to recognize Him simply by the way that He moves in your life. Simply by His presence in your life and leading. People often ask me, well, Pastor, how do I know if this is God leading me or if this is the enemy leading me? How do I know which way to go here? Get to know Jesus. Study his word. When you come to know him and then say, I'll give in, give up, give out all that is in the, my carnal way of being, everything that is selfish and self-absorbed and self-directed, then you'll be walking with Christ. Death to self equals life in Christ, to know what it is to have the Christ life. That's what it's all about this morning. So let's look at a few of these things. Lest you think that I'm ambitious to spend a whole morning on one verse, back in 1867, Charles Spurgeon preached a message on this last line, who loved me and gave himself for me. And I'm told it's one of his shorter sermons. It lasted almost two hours. 
I read it the other day, and it took me almost two hours to read it. It is a wonderful treatise on the love of God. What is God's motivation? We're going to come back to this this morning. His motivation in giving us direction is not that we would hurt, but that we would accept and receive his love. Not that we would be denied anything, but that we would receive all that God has for us. Not that we would be misdirected, but that we would be directed in such a way that we would know what it is to know God. And the second question I ask you this morning, be willing to say, there's nothing else in life, nothing else in life that is more important than following what God has for me. Nothing to give it all up. To say, I wash my hands of self-desires. I, 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 I set myself before you, God, saying, do what with, with me you would, whatever that is. I think I've told this story before, but I was at a pastor's conference one time at Adrian Rogers Church in Memphis, Tennessee, this was about three years before he died. And everybody was waiting for Adrian Rogers to get up and teach. And they had a series of pastors that spoke before him that were all incredible. I would that I could preach like any of them did. But the crowd was rowdy. It was a bunch of pastors. And they were all talking to each other and catching up on their, their lives. And the pastors would come up one after another and preach, and nobody was paying attention. It was just going down the road, and people were just talking out there, and I'm getting caught up with Tom. How's Tom doing? How you been the last couple years? And these guys were just standing up there preaching. And finally, the last one got up to preach right before Adrian Rogers preached, and he stood up, and he came to the pulpit, and he just stood there, and he looked at all these guys talking to each other, running around all over the place. And he said, yes, Lord. They're still rowdy. Yes, Lord. Got a little louder. A few people settled down. Yes, Lord. Everybody got silent. He said, now, Lord, tell us what the question is. Yes, Lord, whatever it is, now tell me what the question is. Incredible message for all of us, who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's what Spurgeon said as part of that message. I just wanted to read it to you because, like I say, I would that I could preach like this. Love is a grand word, even in its silver use among men and women, but love in its golden use with God in heaven, what does it not mean? Oh, marvelous indeed is the love of God toward his people. I say again that I cannot worthily speak of it. Words seem such poor things to express the love of God. They break their backs in trying to convey the wondrous weight of meaning. If this love is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, your heart's love will best read and understand these wondrous facts that the divine being, the everlasting Father, and his ever-blessed Son and the sacred spirit, and the great trinity in unity loves you. Oh, delight yourselves in this glorious truth. It is a sea of sweetness. Dive into it and be filled with it. I bet you wish I could preach that good too. He also said this, Christ is first, and I am last, and the only thing between is love. What a marvelous message. But of course, there's a lot of us that wouldn't want to wait almost two hours to hear a message like that. 1867. That is what it is to be a Christ follower, to walk in the Spirit, to genuinely give yourself over to Christ and say, whatever it is this day you bring before me, that is what I'll be about doing. Whatever it is you bring my way, I'll pay any cost to follow you. He said, if you're not willing to leave your father, mother, brother, sister, family and friends, 
even give your life for me, you're not worthy to follow me. It's a hard message. But that's the message of Jesus Christ for his people. Our problem is we also desire to be in the world. We want, here's what we want as Christians. We want to straddle Christianity. We want one foot in the world, firmly planted where we can escape if we need to, and one world in one foot in the, the world of the Spirit and say, I'll follow you when I want to. And we want to be able to stand bow-legged before God and say, this is how I'm willing to accept and follow you. And that's not how God approaches anything. Christ at Gethsemane, crying out before God, if there's any other way. But not my will, but your will be done. That, that's the cry of the Christian. That's the, that's the cry of the genuine Christ follower. And see, I, I'm not here this morning to give you a guilt trip, but neither am I here to, to play mamsy pamsy with words. This has, listen, I'm not talking about your salvation here. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. But am I willing to say, Christ, save me, and then go live like hell the rest of my life? I want to follow him. I, every time I understand a little more of what the cross means, I desire so much more to draw close to him, to follow him dearly and, and faithfully. And yet everything in my flesh fights against that. Well, you, what do you mean, pastor? You, you mean you still have? Yes, I fight it every day. This flesh desires what it desires. It's fallen. It's corrupt. It has its own desires, its own ways. One foot in the world and one foot in Christ. How many of you would believe it if I said to you, I had stood in one place and I had been in several states all at the same time, some north and some south, some east and some west, and I had stood there in the same place at, the, at, the, at one single time in all of those states, one east, one west, one north, one south. How many of you would believe that? There's a few of you that would believe that. Some of you would just go on like this. The pastor wouldn't tell us a lie. Well, there's a place called the Four Corners. Two of the states are north of the other two. Two of the states are east of the other two. You, you see where I'm going? You can stand in all four places, all four states at exactly the same time. I've actually been there and done exactly what this young lady's doing right here. But then I found out sometime later <clears throat> that this is just a tourist trap put up by the Navajos so that they can make a little extra money. The real place is over about seven miles in the desert, but it's off the main road. So <laughs> I didn't actually do that. And a whole lot of other people haven't actually done that either that think they have. But, that's, but the point is this. We cannot stand... One foot firmly planted in the world and one foot genuinely following Christ. Now we can, we can put on a pretense that we can. we can. We can come to church on Sunday morning and we can smile and we can do our thing and we can perform and we can... But on Monday we want to be right back here again. And that's just the nature of the flesh. And as long as we're following the nature of the flesh, that's what we will do. But when we are genuinely, totally and completely, I'm going to follow Christ. Then that's all that stuff that's tempting on Monday morning doesn't look quite so tempting. And flesh still wants to go there, but the spirit of the man knows inherently that they're not going to be following Christ in that activity. And so there's this war that takes place within all of us. We simply can't live both places at the same time. <coughs> the nature of the man will win out. So if my nature is in Christ, if my desire to follow Christ is more important than the fallen nature of my spirit, then there's going to be a battle that will take place. A dog's nature 
is to roll in stuff that's dead. You turn a dog loose, he'll go to the woods, he'll find something dead, and he'll lay down and roll in it. <coughs> it's part of his nature. It's part of his character. It's part of who he is. You can take a, a white poodle, clean it all up, clip him just right, a little bob on his head, whiskers just standing out, everything perfect. And you can trot him around and he'll look pretty. <clears throat> but if you turn him loose, he'll go to the woods, find something dead and roll in it. Because that's his nature. And here's, here's, the, here's where the solution to this is. We find in Corinthians there's a passage that says that we become new creatures in Christ. <coughs> you get some water. New creatures in Christ. That we become Christ followers that our instincts begin to stand up. It's like the hair on the back of your head standing up when you know something just isn't right. And then it becomes uncomfortable to be involved in that, even when your flesh is drawn to it. And the Holy Spirit will speak to your, your spirit and commune with your spirit, according to Romans chapter 8, my spirit communing with God's spirit. And it will communicate to us what is right and what is wrong, and we will know by the fact that we are walking with the spirit that there is something wrong with this. We don't want to become, thank you, Ben, simply what Jesus called, listen to me carefully, whitewashed sepulchers. Where we simply look good on the outside, but there's something inherently wrong on the inside because we're really not following Christ. Galatians 5.24 says it this way. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If you're going to live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Follow where He is leading. Galatians 6.14 says, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me. The world's been crucified to me. The world is dead to me. The world doesn't have any attraction to me. It's, it's a different place. We become new creatures in Christ. We are totally different in our ambitions and our desires and our love for people. No, we can't live in both places at the same time. Paul says in Romans 6, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Listen, in order that, this is, this is saying, this is the purpose of your death. This is the purpose of your death. The purpose is that we might walk in newness of life in Jesus Christ. That we would die to all those other things. That they would be, we would be different. What do, what do dead men desire? We desire nothing of this world. And when we're alive in Christ, we desire Him. We desire His ways. We desire His desires for our hearts and our lives. We're dead to those things. We don't have any desire for it. You, you, can, you know you can poke a dead man and he doesn't care? He doesn't care. Doesn't make any difference. To be, a, to be dead to self, to be dead to the things of the flesh. It's a different thing. Paul's former self. This is from the ESV study Bible, by the way. Paul's former self, the person Paul was before he trusted Christ, with all of his sinful goals and proud, selfish, self-exalting desires, came to a decisive end. He died to self. He died to self. Why was Paul's conversion so dramatic that that I talked about just a week ago. When Paul was, Paul was saved, it instantly he had a 180 turn that he changed on a dime because he came to the realization of exactly who Jesus Christ was and who he remains today, and he said, I will follow him. And everything changed. 
new creatures in Christ. For Paul, it seemed to be instantaneous. All he needed to know was this, teach me more about you. Tell me more about you that I might be able to share this with, with all of mankind. So, what is it? So how's your death coming along? That's my question for you this morning. How is your death coming along? Should just stop right here. Have prayer and send you home. That's the question what we should be asking ourselves every day. How, how am I dying today? Not how am I living today. How am I dying today? How about if I've died to self and given my life to Christ and following him, he'll lay out the day. Trust me, it, normally it's not my plan. He'll lay out the day. Romans 8, beginning in verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that, here's that purpose statement again, why did God send his son? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. How was the righteousness of the law fulfilled in me? In Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm incapable of fulfilling that. I'm totally without any ability to begin that journey. But God sent his son to die for me and for you. Amen. He became, according to, the, according to the scriptures, Jesus became sin to fulfill the condemnation of sin. Here's, here's a deeper thought. He became your sin. And he became my sin. He became that. Not just, not just putting it on him. We're going to see a text here in a minute where Je it says Jesus was the propitiation of our sin. Up until this time, sin was put on an animal and the animal sacrifice, that's expiation. It was, the sins were figuratively put on the animal that he might die for the sins of the people. Jesus became our sin. Every fiber of his being became our sin. That when he died, we might live. Amen. Amen. That we might live according to the Spirit of God. We can walk in the Spirit not by our own power. We can't. None of us can. Pastor Tom's a good man, but he can't. None of us can. It is about giving it all to him. Allowing and understanding receiving this forgiveness because listen he died for your sins but in order to walk in the spirit you need to receive that forgiveness guess what if I stand in my own flesh in any situation in life particularly as I go out to do ministry if I stand in my own flesh I will inevitably completely and totally fail I will I might think I've done great things. I might reach my hand over my back and do this. But I will completely and utterly fail if I go out in my flesh. This is about his spirit living through the believer. And listen, it's not just for pastors anymore. Every true believer in Jesus Christ, he says, I want you to walk this way. I want you to talk this way. I want you to be the Christ follower that you say you are on Sunday morning. I want you to be that. Galatians 2.20, that's what it is to be crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Let's take a look at that. Joshua 24.15, you think, lest you think this is just New Testament stuff. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day whom you will serve. Listen, there, it's no accident you are here today. It's no accident you are here. Choose this day. Who are you going to serve? And if you're going to serve him, 
Let, let me just encourage you. Let, let, no, as your pastor, let me plead with you. Please don't try to do this in the flesh. You will break your own heart and you'll break the hearts of those around you. You will dirty his name in the process. It must be in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this, people. This is God living in and through you. And he desires to do that. But he will not come and take you and make you. But he is there knocking at the door. And if you answer, he will say, come in. That's a promise of God. Jesus speaking to the church says, I would that you be hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. That's a polite translation. It literally means to vomit you out of his mouth. In fact, it's even stronger than that if you go back to the, the original language. Projectile vomiting out of his mouth. It's serious stuff. Again, this is not about keeping the law and the rules. I have to keep reminding us of that as we go along. I'm not begging you. In fact, I'm, I'm specifically asking you not to make this about trying to discipline yourself to do all these things. That's what the Pharisees did. This is about Jesus Christ who has come into your life in the person of the Holy Spirit who is living in every true believer that desires to live his life out through you given all the gifts that he has given you, your personality, your talents, your gifts and abilities, and to live through you the Christ life. To be, to be able to do what you and I cannot do. Most of the things that Elva and I have seen happen in our ministry in the last 20 years or so have been things, listen to me real carefully, have been things, and this is absolutely, don't think I haven't thought about these words, I thought about them carefully. Everything that's happened that is of any consequence and our ministry for the last 20 years or so has been things we could not possibly do. I couldn't choreograph it. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't possibly accomplish it. But it's been about Christ and him living through us in such a way that it became real. And you stand back, and, and I do, often I stand back and I go, whew, Look. You just want to laugh. Look what you did through me, God. Through me. Even me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Dead to self, no longer I who live. Dead to selfish ambition, dead to sinful goals and selfish, selfish exalting desires dead to self-direction, dead to the priorities of this temporal world, alive in Christ eternal, who lives in me, empowers me, and is exalted through me. That is my prayer. Dead. You want to know how to go out of the church this morning? Here it is. D-O-A. Dead on arrival. Just leave here dead to self. Well, what would you learn in church this morning? I learned how to be dead. What would you learn about in church this morning? Death? Well, I don't want to go to that church. It's true. Some of you leave out here this morning, you'll go, that's too much. I need to go somewhere else. That's, that's the natural inclination of the flesh. It just is. Dead. 2 Corinthians 4.10 Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that, here's your purpose statement, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. 
carrying with me the death of Jesus. Death, Christ, Christ died for my sins. I don't, have to, I don't have to fix that. I have to receive the gift. Can I get just one amen? amen. Just receive the gift. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested through our mortal flesh. The life, Christ's life, we're walking in the Spirit. This is what this means. To, to walk in the Spirit, this is what it's like. It's like me getting up in the morning saying, I'm dead, Lord, you're alive. Take this shell and use it. Well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor. Da 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 da. Excuses. Listen, here's the answer to all, any excuse you want to come up with right now. Here's the answer. Dead on arrival. But pastor, I can't. Dead on arrival. But pastor, you don't know what they said to me. Dead on arrival. You want to argue with somebody? Put somebody down? Make, make them think that they're, you're something more? Dead on arrival. Dead on arrival. True Christian freedom is found in the Christ life. It's not a freedom to sin, but rather freedom from the desire to sin. And knowing when we do sin, that is, step in it rather than wallow in it like a dog, that all of the penalty of our sins are crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. Now we're going to focus on the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. 2 Corinthians 10, verse, beginning in verse number 3. Write it down. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. What does, Galatians, or what does Ephesians say about fighting the spiritual battle? You don't wage it in the flesh. It's a spiritual war. Let me give you a hint. Your flesh your cunning, your brilliance, your sharpness, your physical prowess, your mental prowess doesn't stand a chance against the devil. It is in this walking in the spirit that he is conquered. It is not in attacking him in the flesh or by some memorized set of, of words that you've, that you've accumulated it's by living in the spirit of, of the moment of Christ, listening to the Holy Spirit working in you, following him, and he will give you the things to do and say. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but of the divine power to destroy strongholds. This destroy is a strong word, Pastor. We're supposed to destroy stuff? Yes. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we're to destroy the strongholds that, tear, that hold us back from following Him, that destroy our families, destroy those strongholds, those spiritual strongholds. You, it's, it's not about a formula of words. It's about a lifestyle in Christ. Please understand, this is about a lifestyle in Jesus Christ. We destroy arguments. This is one of the apologist's favorite passages right here. We destroy arguments. And every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And every thought we hold captive to obey Christ. We destroy arguments. Why do I come and talk about needing to understand where people are coming from and what their thought processes are and understanding something about these other religions? And because... If we're going to destroy the arguments that are putting down God, these opinions, then we, and, do it, and do that in love, we need to understand what the problem is. Why, why, why just go talk to people? Why, why ask questions and listen? Because we need to understand where they are coming from so that we can destroy the arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And if we tear away all the excuses, the Holy Spirit 
quite often has a pathway to come into the human heart and make a difference. Just take away the, the excuses lovingly, kindly, with, with embracing the person, letting them know you genuinely care about them. That is not, this is not about you becoming some fierce warrior. It's, be, it's about you submitting to the Holy Spirit. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. The word faith is a lofty word, and quite often what happens is this. Just have faith. Faith in what? Faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're a Christ follower. It is in him that we have faith. I don't have faith in myself. I don't have faith in my bank account. I don't have faith in my automobile. I don't have faith in my car. I don't have faith in any of the things that I own. I don't have faith in those things. I have faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. And that faith causes me to, listen, another word for faith is just trust. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you to come alongside and lead me and that you'll never leave me or forsake me and that you will protect me in all things. And even when it looks like there is no hope for me physically, mentally, emotionally, in every which way I can, I trust you. And all those other things are just fleshly arguments. But I'm so hurt. Pitiful little you. I'm so devastated. Do you have Jesus by your side? You know, when somebody tells me that they're overwhelmed and they just can't follow Christ because they're so overwhelmed, here's what I, here's what I would say to you. That's a lack of trust in Him. It's just a lack of trust in Him. Because if He is your Lord, if He is your Savior, if you are submitting to Him, then wherever He leads you and you go, faithfully. A lot of you have stepped up the last few months. It's been miraculous for me just to watch what God's doing in you guys. You've stepped up the last few months and, and you've, you've dedicated yourself and you've come alongside the people in this church and you've committed yourself to doing things around here and giving and, and loving each other in ways that many churches don't have. And I'm blessed by that. But, 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 but I want you to step it up more. <laughs> I don't want us to be satisfied. I, I want us to come to, to love him and to have faith in the Son of God who gave himself for us, who became our sin. 1 John 4, 9. 1 John's wonderful. Uh, eight, eight times that I can count through the book of 1 John, he is saying, I'm telling you this that you might know. I'm telling you this that you might know. God wants you to know how much he loves you. God wants you to know these things. All the way through 1 John, I'm telling you this stuff, listen, that you might know. Not just that you might intellectually receive that information and store it away in megabytes. I, I want you to genuinely know. In this the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. We might live through Him. Agape. This is the love, he says. This is the love. I think we don't really understand this word agape very much. So I want to just quit, do a quick tutorial to give you something to think about. Agape is always sacrificial. This kind of love is always sacrificial. It will always, listen to these words, maybe this will ring true, it will always cost you something. Agape will always cost you something. It's, it's, never, it's never given expecting something in return or holding out for something to come back to them. It, it's always given sacrificially. It, it is 
a sacrificial love that di Jesus died for you and I on the cross. It's sacrificial. He gave himself for me. Gave himself for me. It's sacrificial. It's a decision, and it's not meritorious. Now, what that means is I don't merit God's love. He didn't look at me and go, there's Dave. He deserves my love. No, I don't. It's never about my merit. He looks at me and says, I choose to love you. I choose to love you in spite of you. I choose to love you even though I know what you'll do tomorrow. I choose to love you that way. Agape is a choice. It may become emotional, but it's not rooted or caused or dictated by emotion. It's, you don't wake up one day and say, I fell out of agape with you. It's a contradiction in terms that cannot be overcome by the oxymoron. You cannot say, I fell out of agape with you. You might say, I fell out of filio with you. But you don't say, I fell out of agape with you, because agape is a choice, and it is always a commitment. A commitment. Do you, do you understand what commitment means? It is a commitment that says, I'll love you regardless. And, and here's, here's the caption beside this word. This is the same word that God uses to say, this is how you ought to love one another. It's a commitment, regardless of what you get back. Regardless of what you get back, you don't like. If regardless if they seem obnoxious. Do you know that there, I, I, let me give you a news flash. There are some people in this world that are obnoxious. And God calls on you to love them. Agape them. It is a decision that we make. It's not rooted in emotion. It may, again, become emotional. I've made a decision to love people that I go, God, I've made a decision to love them, but you know I'm struggling with this. And I'd pray. He, and one of the things I've learned to do is if, if, if I really find somebody terribly obnoxious, pray for them. If you'll pray for them, it's hard to, to remain enemies. Pray for them. Agape, I choose. It's not dictated by my emotion because emotion changes day in and day out. I'll fall out of love every day with stuff. But agape, I never do. It's not contingent on reciprocation. If that person never returns that love, ever, ever does anything to make you think that they appreciate it, You've chosen to do that anyway. That's agape. And that's the way God says he loves you. He chose you before the foundations of the world, and he says, I choose to love them. And, and God has the perspective like this, even knowing all that you would do. Not just up to what, that point, but knowing all you would do. I choose to love you. Galatians 2.20. He loved us and gave himself for us. 1 John 4, beginning in verse number 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. Sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not an expiation, the propitiation to actually become sin for us. Beloved, if God so loved us, every one of these words loved here, eight times, is agape. Beloved. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know. Do you want to know if you're living in the spirit of the living God? You want to know what the litmus test is for that this morning? Right here it is. All this stuff right here. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. Send his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Be loved. If God loved us, we also ought to love one another. If one has ever, no one has ever seen God, if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he abides in us because he has given us of his spirit. That is the nature of the very spirit of God. And if that is the nature by which you are giving, that is the litmus test. You want to know 
This is the test. This is a test. It's not about how many gold stars I've got next to my name in the Sunday school room. It's about this test that says, if that's who you are, that's how you can know. He is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. Let me tell you, let me tell you what the shock of that is. You wake up one morning and you go about your life and you begin your life that day with a prayer. God, use me today. Any way that you would see fit, just use me today. And in the course of that day, things happen that your flesh would do otherwise, but God moves in and he uses you in particular ways that at the end of the day, you can honestly look there and say, this whole day was not like me at all but it was a whole lot like Jesus. That's my prayer. That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer. By this we know that we abide in him. I am crucified with Christ and yet I live. Yet it is not I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen and amen. Father God, we serve to you this day, and we ask you to be...